Hi everybody, um, for a change, so that you don't just have to listen to me drone on all the time, I thought it would be nice to meet an actual philosopher. Uh, and here we are in um, a nice public park with cicadas buzzing in the background. I'm here with um, John Russin. Um, he is a good friend and philosophical mentor to me, who um, teaches philosophy at um, the University of Guelph. And uh, so, John, I, I uh, just probably students are wondering what uh, made you get interested in philosophy. Yeah. Um, well, you know, philosophy philosophy can mean different things. Um, it can mean uh, just sort of being philosophical in your everyday life. It can mean studying philosophy at university, or it can mean uh, that you know tradition of of uh, great thinkers who whose insights have shaped our culture. And uh, so, I mean, I, I have an involvement with all of those things, but they're different. Um, and so I think that, uh, and I, I think that my relationship to all of them is mostly defined by that first one, like just trying to be philosophical. So I don't, uh, I don't especially think of philosophy as a, as a sort of a esoteric body of knowledge. So sometimes people imagine that philosophy is a, um, a special set of doctrines you're going to learn, um, and that it's, it's especially about what you can wrap your mind around or something like that. And I don't think that's quite right. Um, I really think that philosophy is, is, a, is a very basic human practice that should, it should matter to everybody, uh, and it comes up everywhere, and it, it really is uh, a matter of uh, in the broadest sense, trying to understand what's what's going on around you, and the you know, not surprisingly, the more you actually understand, the more issues are brought to your attention. And so, as you begin your explorations, more and more things open up, and you see, oh, I got to do this too, and I got to do this too, right? Um, and so, um, so I think my interest in philosophy came from just being a child like anybody else. I think children are interested in that, and I was interested in that. And I happened to grow up in an environment where that kind of ongoing questioning was supported. And so I, th I think in that sense, like many people, I was just kind of philosophical. I was just interested in understanding things. And it happened then that when I uni went to university, which is I guess then the second level, um, I kind of, I didn't, I wasn't, I was interested in learning. I liked learning for the reason I just gave, but I wasn't really involved in university particularly. So I took a course here and I took a course there, and I got C's. And I didn't do I didn't do very well, um, and I also didn't much care. I mostly just practiced my guitar. But then I took a philosophy class because a friend of mine was taking one. He said, "You want to take this class with me?" And I thought, "Sure." And when I took that class, I discovered that uh, that that kind of study in university really interested me. Really fed my my. Um, my interest in study, and that's then especially because of that third thing, like we were studying people like Plato and Descartes, and um, what what I there, what I learned in that class, which actually kind of surprised me, was that there's stuff to find out. Mm -hmm. You know, that you read Plato and you and you learn something. Uh, it's not unlike uh, going to your physics class, except it's not physics, but you you learn something. You think, holy cow, I could have spent my whole life thinking about stuff on my own and I never would have that never would have occurred to me and the same with Descartes and so um, so I, I discovered that even though as I said philosophy is not a kind of esoteric knowledge that it's really just part of this everyday human practice I discovered through my university classes that there actually is something to learn there and that these and over the years and years of studying it now I really feel like I've learned that the reason we study those people we do is because those are the people in human history who have um, who have had these world-changing insights, and, it, and it's not because they made something up. It's really because they have they're doing what everybody is doing, and they're, especially they're doing what everybody at their time and culture is doing. And the people we study are the people who um, most powerfully and insightfully capture the, the, the things that people are trying to understand and mm -hmm. the insight that 
people or even a whole culture is, is trying to figure out. And so the, when you study those philosophers, ultimately, you're not studying the bright ideas of a handful of people. You're, you're studying the, the ways that the, that the deepest insights that our whole world is built around, that our human life is built around, the ways those were articulated. Mm -hmm. And, and those, you get those ideas in their kind of um, inaugural form. Um, and so my, my interest, I think, then, it came from those two things. Uh, it came from wanting to understand the world around me and discovering that there is something to be understood. And the great philosophers are the people who uh, actually have profound things to communicate about those things. And then, and I found that studying it in university is, is almost the only way you're ever going to get that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go, uh, go at your home and think you're going to read any of these books, like you get something out of them. But, 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 but like physics or, or mathematics, like it's a, it's a thing that, that generations of people have worked on and to really see the point of it, you often need guidance. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of my, my overall experience of philosophy and how I got into it and why I stuck with it. And, and, and it has been very satisfying to me. It's completely changed and made how I understand reality, how I understand my life. It's kind of mm -hmm. long-winded. No, it's great. Um, Your yeah. students might be used to long-winded. <laughs> yes, they probably are. Um, so um, that was interesting, um, and I know that this has been a major influence that, that uh, John here has had on me to think about the figures in the history of philosophy not as you know a series of, of ideas and claims about reality, but as but as people who are are trying to respond to what's real in um, human affairs yeah. and uh, but um, one thing that's that's um, that's maybe an easier way into that sort that attitude is uh, the course that um, my students here are taking which is existentialism which thematizes uh, that um, very explicitly and um, uh, I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts about uh, yeah the importance of existentialism yeah I mean I guess I guess if I had to say what I how I think about things, I would basically say I'm an existentialist because, because uh, I mean, I think existentialism at root is about that idea that um, we're, there's a distinctive kind of thing that we are, which is, um, we usually use the word freedom to name it, but you know, that's an easy word. And then you think, well, what does that actually mean? And, and but that we, we are these free beings and, and that basically means our very, um, our very way of existing is that we're engaged with a world that we have to make sense of. And like we experience ourselves as having to make sense of it in the way that a cat, my cat, doesn't particularly. Like it, the cat's involved with the world in a way too, but things are pretty much set up so that things are just going to roll on and, and the cat's going to roll with it. But human beings who are free in the strong sense um, are kind of inherently... Um, gripped by or even imprisoned by the question like what does this mean or what is this about or, or why why is this why am I here right and so those those questions of sort of making sense of your own life hand in hand with making sense of the world uh, um, is, is who we are um, and so I think I, I think that that's co a correct way to understand what we are um, and uh, and so in that, that's why, as, as you were saying, like that, the way I think about philosophy is that it is a gripping existential issue. Mm -hmm. And so I, I especially have benefited from the study of the philosophers that we call existentialists. So some of them actually use that word to describe themselves, but you know, it's, again, it's just a label. But, mm -hmm. but, the, but I've been especially gripped by those figures whose thinking has been oriented by that idea that uh, our kind of fundamental reality as people, as persons, is that we are grappling with a world we're trying to make sense of. And making sense of it doesn't just mean like a cooking recipe, knowing that if you do this, you'll get that. That's part, you know, you want to learn how to make things work, but understanding it doesn't just mean that. It means that deeper question of what is this about or what does it mean? And, um, uh, and that's uh, and I guess it may, maybe put, put a little more personal spin on it. At some level, grasping what the world means is wrapped up in this question of what does my life mean? And I, I think that the way that existentialism 
takes all those kinds of questions very seriously, but sort of wraps them back around this way that just for us to live out our lives as persons, we, we're, we're going to be stuck grappling with the issue of what am I doing and am I, uh, how am I living my life? I, I think that's um, profoundly true and insightful as a, discussion, as a description of what our lives are like. And I think it really is the case that people in their lives uh, face real existential crises and they face them the worst if they don't take those issues seriously, right? right? And so right. I, th I think existentialism is is uh, extremely insightful and and also, again, I was saying before, it's not just some sort of isolated esoteric study. I, I think it's it, uh, grappling with existentialism and studying it can be a huge part of just sort of mental health, of, of, of actually doing the thing you need to do to be able to live your life well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of the, the figures that we're studying in the course, or the, perhaps the centerpiece of the course, insofar as we're spending like a third of the class on, on it, is um, Jean-Paul Sartre and his being in nothingness. Yeah. And I know that students, um, um, in, my, in my past experience, have um, found it sort of to be a struggle when they first get to Sartre and start to think maybe this is kind of that esoteric yeah. stuff. But uh, in fact, that's not the case. He's deeply invested in trying to give expression to something that would be meaningful to any human being. And I wonder yeah. if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I hate reading Sartre. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think um, it's like he took a course in being obscure. Uh, but <laughs> but he, he's, he's very tough to read sometimes. Not always, but sometimes he's very tough to read. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of things about his writing that are frustrating. But, but his his insights are just overwhelmingly powerful. Mm -hmm. And there are some parts of him that are not hard to read. So he is mm -hmm. at his best, I think, when he just describes uh, human situations. Like when he describes, uh, he has a section called The Look, where he talks about seeing someone in a public park, or mm -hmm. in the early chapter on negation, he has a discussion of the gambler, or he has this great mm -hmm. description of vertigo. Um, so he, he describes all these situations, and I think I think he's really good at um, putting you into a situation and showing you something about it. Um, if you haven't already been turned off by his writing when you get to it, but I, I think so. I think those I think those things are great. And if you um, get get those points from those readings, then when you make the turn to his, you know, the next page where he's kind of analyzing those things, his analyses are you discover are also quite brilliant and, mm -hmm. and really ins insightful. But you have to get you have to get into those experiences first and then see what he's saying. And then there are always some pages that are kind of obscure. But <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, but so I so but yeah, so he's a difficult writer. But he but he but he's also a very powerful writer, especially once you learn how to get into it. But yeah, I've been very um, uh, I've been very influenced by Sartre. I think he's he's one of the really great ones. And um, he wasn't—he uh, wasn't one of the, uh, uh, the people who initially most captured my excitement. I, I was more interested in figures like Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, uh, and some others, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, but I came back to Sartre after having studied him in my undergraduate, and and then really realized how much he he was saying the same things I was getting from those other figures, and he added a lot. Um, so I, th I think he's, um, I think he's maybe, he may even be the most, uh, the most insightful of all those thinkers. He's extremely good at d detecting kind of the, I don't know, I don't quite know the right word for it, but sort of the mechanisms or structures of our experience. Like he's mm. quite good at detecting what's going on over here and what's going on over here and alerting you to um, to things that are happening in your experience that you you don't that you just take for granted, but if you if you then notice them, you see oh, um, that's a thing I could deal with differently. Like by being alerted to the way I guess this is what I'm saying by being alerted to the ways we make sense of things, by being alerted to the different dimensions that are shaping how we find our lives meaningful we develop the possibility of 
taking those different dimensions seriously and changing our relationship mm -hmm. to them. So I think he's especially good at that. And I think of all of those, the one he's, he's I think, probably most uh, most uh, powerfully connected with is, is our experience of other people and how, how just what it is to experience another person, what that is as an experience, and what the dimensions are of that, and then all the implications that come from that. You know, you're talking about Being in Nothingness, which is a you know, great book. He has another huge, great book called The Critique of Dialectical Reason, and mm -hmm. that is really kind of a, a, a really rich analysis of society and history, and uh, it's even more difficult to read than Being in Nothingness, but it is, again, it, it's, it's uh, just profoundly insightful, and that, so I think it's, it's one of the most powerful works of social and political philosophy I've ever read, uh, because it's rooted in this, his real ability to grasp just the, what it means to deal with another person and the forms that can take. So anyway, so, I don't know, uh, so yeah, I think Sartre is a, is a great one. And he has, he has really come to influence me a lot, especially in my thinking about um, just th this thing, the different kind of, um, dif the different dimensions or aspects of how we make our lives meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we, we're actually going to read um, uh, some of those, um, some passages from uh, the chapter on the look. Yeah, that's um, a great one. When, when, um, in a couple of weeks, I believe. So that should be pretty, pretty exciting, and this might uh, help be an avenue into that. Um, uh, right now, um, the students are uh, just finishing up the first chapter, in which they're talking about some of the things that you mentioned about uh, um, uh, the experience of. Oh well, well, well. The, it's about the experience of what he calls anguish, but um, yeah. but you mentioned the uh, example of vertigo and the example yeah. of the gambler, and uh, in some respects, that's one of the things that Sartre is most famous for. Yep. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it's worthwhile to get a clear understanding of what it is that he's trying to say there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy. You know, I was I was sort of distinguishing a. Roughly, you know, my existence as a person from my cat's existence, and talking about the way for the cat, things are just going to roll on, um, and uh, and so the thing is, people often kind of live that way, um, and we do it, I presume, because of habituation. We we excuse me, we grow up with uh, with our families or in our societies with other people, you know, and we we um, we get. We, we become habituated to certain ways of doing things and we think oh you do this you do that you know you you uh, get up in the morning and you have breakfast and you get or you get up in the morning and you get dressed or when, when you go outside you brush your hair like I, you know I don't even know this but simple things like you, you we we get used to those things such that we don't notice that they're choices we don't notice that they're um, ways some group of people like ourselves and our mom and dad and the people around us have come to decide this is how we're going to behave, but there's there's nothing in those practices that uh, intrinsically makes them necessary, or and and nothing in those practices that intrinsically makes them necessary mm -hmm. for us. Whereas for the cat, I mean, it's not it's not necessary that uh, I suppose this um, I don't know simulate that certain things happen in the world with a mouse and with a piece of dirt and something like that in a leaf but for a cat it's necessary that it's going to chase that mouse and mm -hmm. so on because cats kind of have that uh, that way of making sense of things um, uh, handed down to them just in their in their in their cat nature but you know one of the things that existentialism so so much stresses and it's related to this issue of freedom is that in that sense we don't have a nature mm -hmm. we have a situation we have we have a human condition the human condition is that we find ourselves in a world and we have to make sense of it, you know, at, we could say more about that, but that's the basic thing. Mm -hmm. But that's not a nature in the way the cat has a nature in the sense that, um, uh, well, as Sartre says, that, in that the cat in that sense has an essence that precedes its existence, mm -hmm. right? In the sense that the, what it is to be a cat has kind of already been decided and that's going to dictate how the cat carries out its living but for us he says our existence precedes our essence we we have a condition and who we're going to be and how we're going to live is not something that forces our hand it's rather already a consequence of us making choices and us making decisions and so we we as a certain group of people have come to decide 
oh, we're going to get up in the morning and brush our hair and put on clothes and we go outside and eat breakfast mm -hmm. first thing. Um, but that didn't have to be, and not everybody does it. Um, but we, we get in that habit and we start to treat it as if it is nature, as mm -hmm. if it is essential. And, you know, maybe that example of eating breakfast seems kind of trivial, but, but, but those issues come up more deeply when we, when we look at our habitual, habituated expectations about what it means to deal well with another person or what it means to have a relationship. And we start to think, oh, well, you're supposed to get married when you're 25, you know, and, and that suddenly becomes a thing as if it were a rule handed down just by the nature mm -hmm. of things. Um, relationships have to take this form. Uh, life career choices have to take this form. You better get a good job, you know. All these things, um, you, you, you can get, you can, in our societies, we typically grow up with a sort of picture of, of life mapped out for us that kind of says, this is what a human being's life is like that's not so different from what a biologist might tell you a cat's life is like. Mm -hmm. And we make the mistake of believing with maybe without even thinking about it, that there is a path and a pattern we're supposed to conform to, and we just go along doing that. Um, uh, so the point about anguish and so on is that that way of living that I've just described, where we become habituated to certain ways of interpreting ourselves in the world without recognizing that we're interpreting, without recognizing that we're choosing, um, that way of living is is us kind of living with a fundamental dishonesty about our own reality, right? It, it means we're free beings pretending we're cats. We're free beings um, where the principle we've built our self-interpretation around is, is that in a fundamental way we're not free. Um, and that also means then we're building our life around the belief that our choices are not choices and which is a lie and so uh, a that that dishonesty about ourselves often comes back to bite us you know it'll be when when for example you then start living you know with the view that well since i did this this is supposed to happen this is the way the story goes and then it doesn't happen because other people choose not to live that way or or you know god didn't sort things out so that every time you live according to the plan you get great results you know often we are confronted with the reality later in life that choices we made two five ten years earlier that we pretended were not choices reveal to us that they were choices mm -hmm. and uh we were thinking oh everything's going to roll along and suddenly no you made this choice and it was a shitty choice and uh you, you, you get yourself in trouble. Yeah. Right? That's, that can happen a lot. So that's one of the ways our choices that um, we pretend are not choices can come back to bite us. But, but even if, but I guess the way I was describing that there made it sound like, you know, you get into a practical bind and that happens. But I think even more, and this is really maybe where the issue of anxiety comes up, there's just a thing about us that is a, almost like hunger. Like we have yeah, we have a need to take our own freedom seriously, to take ourselves as free choosing beings seriously. And if we spend our lives living in this sort of dishonest way I was saying, that's like a life of just trying to suppress this thing about yourself. And um, uh, uh, typically, and here, you know, you, you, this, this starts to sound like psychology, and, and there, are, there is lots of great psychology that works around exactly this theme. You suppress that thing long enough, and at a certain point in your life, it just starts blowing up. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this thing inside you that's the, the, the little, it's like the human being inside you is saying, you're not treating me like a human being. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, because you've built your life in a way that's sort of built around not acknowledging that, there's no easy way for that voice inside you to say that. So it comes out in anxiety. Mm -hmm. It comes out in um, mm -hmm. uh, crippling inability to sleep at night or um, uh, an inability to go out in public or things like that, right? Where the world can suddenly seem uh, like you don't fit with it anymore and you, you have this kind of pervasive malaise that you can't quite understand, but maybe it makes you feel like committing suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, this, that's, that's just a, a, a well-documented reality in human life that I think 
this, this sort of existentialism, existentialist analysis really explains very well. And, but then the amazing thing about that anxiety is that you experience it as something bad. You think, oh, I'm just, why is this going wrong? And in fact, what, what, it's, what it really is, is your existence telling you, no, no, it's the other thing you were doing that's the sick part. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, it's really, as people mm -hmm. sometimes like to say, it's kind of a wake-up call, but it's like it's a wake-up call, uh, if you want to use that kind of old language, it's a wake-up call from your soul, mm -hmm. you know, telling you like, come on, uh, you're living in a way that's, um, that's, that's crippling us, you know? Um, and so that anxiety, I mean, this is maybe one of the greatest things about Sartre and Heidegger and some of these other existentialist philosophers who've really emphasized that theme of anguish or anxiety, is that anxiety is one of the healthiest things because it, it is your freedom calling attention to itself. And it's your freedom, in the sense I was talking about before, it's your freedom as that gripping existential issue of making your life meaningful. Like that's the thing that's that's shouting at you. It's the voice of freedom calling you to like get serious. Well, may, maybe serious isn't quite the right word. Get real mm -hmm. and and uh, uh, own up to your freedom. And the thing is, so often what we do then is run away from that. Uh, and that's in a way what we were already doing in in sort of lying to ourselves about our choices. But when that anxiety comes up, we often try to flee from it and think, okay, I'm going to try to paper it over or hide it somehow and get back to the normal. You think, I just want to get back to normal, um, which typically doesn't work. Um, but, the, but as I was saying, like the, the, the interesting and the great thing is that, that that anxiety that looks threatening is actually typically the route to, to kind of health. And so it, those experiences of anxiety are dealt with well when we... Well, when we try to own up to our responsibilities in making our lives meaningful, and it's, it's often a painful process, but the thing that comes out on the other end when you have lived through that anxiety and more honestly recognized the role that, that you have been choosing your own life, like the, that produces a situation, it seems to me, where we live happier and better lives. And then, I mean, that's... And that issue, I think, is probably pretty timely right now because I imagine a lot of people feel quite a bit of anxiety in the context of this pandemic because the, the thing I was talking about, like the familiar world that looked like it was going to work, uh, it's not working. Yeah. Not exactly because of a choice of yours in any simple sense, but, but also it's, it's not unrelated to a choice of yours. Like you were buying into this program, right? And now, in a way, you see what that, what that program was worth. Like it was, things aren't going very well. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so people also then talk about wanting this, um, uh, wonder when normal's going to return. Well, maybe you don't really want normal to return. Like it, this, this, this anxiety can be an opportunity to shift your idea from the sense that the ready-made program in the world is going to make your life for you to that idea that, you know, whether you're, whether you're in, um, the heyday of the industrial resolution revolution or the catastrophe of the fall of the roman empire like uh you remain a human being who has to try to make a worthwhile and meaningful life and that's that's the human condition right that that no matter what the situation is you as a human being anybody as a human being faces that same kind of issue which is how to make my inhabitation of this situation that i am actually in meaningful and and worthwhile, a site where something good is actually happening. And that rich and fulfilling life can be lived just as much in the fall of Rome as it can be in, you know, the period of economic prosperity, and maybe even in some ways more so, because that the more disastrous situation may, may make it easier to be honest about our own freedom and our own mm -hmm. responsibilities. Anyway, so that that's, so I think the thing about anguish is that it's, it's, it's the voice of your own freedom calling to you to, to own up to the fact that you're free and, and to, to, to own up to the responsibilities of being free. And I think that Sartre's analysis of that is, 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 is really brilliant. And I think it is a, it is a hugely important issue in life um, uh, out of, uh, in these ways that I've just been saying. So, yeah, I think that's, um, that's an excellent, that's a great chapter. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. Yeah, my pleasure.